everybody and welcome back to another brand new video where today we are looking back on the Doctor Dances, the next episode of series one as we get towards the conclusion to the series now as well. So yes of course this story concluded Stephen Moffat's first ever um, story for Doctor Who in the second part of the Doctor Dances after The Empty Child last week. Um, it's a story that I think continues to be exceptionally strong through part two as well. It wasn't just one of those where part one's good and then part two kind of lets it down. I feel like it's a genuinely satisfying conclusion to a Doctor Who two-parter where you are actually, like the resolution makes sense, is actually clever, just actually works, which I think can so often be a letdown in two-parters in New Who. So yes, what is there to say about this story? Well, of course, it picks up when um, the Doctor and uh, Rose and Jack are seemingly cornered by all the gas mask zombie people until the Doctor tells them to go to your room and hopefully that defeats them uh, or gets them to go away. And it, although it's kind of, I guess, almost quite funny, um, it makes such perfect sense. It's just so logical um, within the sort of sense of the story and it's well explained and everything. So I think that actually it's a really, really effective resolution to a cliffhanger, um, not just something silly to try and get out of it, but actually it works really well. This does have some rather fascinating kind of um, dynamics between the main characters in this story, between the Doctor, Rose and Jack. There's definitely a bit of kind of um, jealousy from the Doctor towards Jack and Jack seemingly sort of coming on the scene, flirting away with Rose, Rose saying, oh yeah, he's attractive and the Doctor sort of pretending not to be offended by it and things like that. Um, it's just fascinating to kind of see this, this developing dynamic where you're not quite sure whether there's a romantic interest between the Doctor and Rose, I think, in this incarnation. Obviously, we all know about Ten Rose and all of that, but I feel like there's just kind of occasional hints at it um, through um, series one with Nine and Rose, but it's obviously never kind of explicitly stated, but certainly in this story you just get that element that actually now that Rose is showing more attention towards Jack at points in this story and sort of thinking him as the attractive one, um, he's getting rather jealous. And so it's just, I just found it really, really kind of interesting to explore. And in many ways, some of the kind of quite um, interesting ideas um, that are presented in this story, particularly when the Doctor and Rose are basically talking about how in the future humans are going to go and mate with um, lots of different races and alien kinds, and that's basically what they're going to do. They're going to dance the equivalent of, of going have some fun with them, shall we say. I, it just was quite a, a very sort of interesting story with these kind of under the surface sort of almost innuendos, I guess, to an extent, and exactly what the Doctor dances means and dancing is kind of used in different senses throughout this story. I, I personally am not fully, maybe I'm just not reading the story correctly, but I don't fully understand why there's so much emphasis on the Doctor dances and the Doctor actually showing that he can dance to Rose. I don't know if it's just sort of helping sort of create that dynamic between the three characters and kind of showing the Doctor's skills and kind of impressing Rose and, and all those kind of things. If you guys have got a kind of better explanation of just for me to fully understand the kind of relevance of the Doctor dancing in this story, I'd love to know. I think it's fun and I think it, it's, it, it's entertaining, but I don't know if it's got a much deeper meaning to it than that. I know apart, apart from the occasional references to dancing meaning something rather different. In in many ways, this story, this part, this second part of the story becomes even more kind of Moffat-esque I don't know, and just in the way the dialogue's done and written and things with um, the Doctor having a banana and saying and replacing Jack's sonic blaster with a banana and things like that. They're just very Moffat-y type things to do. The sort of um, the, the factory of Villengard that's now a banana, banana farm basically that was some weapons factory in the past or something is also just a funky idea. And of course we go to Villengard in Stephen Moffat's final story, The Twice Upon a Time, which is just a really cool thing for him to do, to take it right back to his very first story where he mentioned Villengard and finally we go there. I think clearly one of the best things about this story is the rock solid resolution to this story in that actually Jamie is Nancy's son and not his her little brother that actually it was all about that he and all of them were always calling for her in Mummy and that by sort of connect connecting to each other they are able to um, be sort of revived and brought back to normal. The idea of the nanogenes come play, playing into things as well and that being all explained that actually they were the things inside the, the um, ambulance, war, Tula ambulance thingy that crashed and that's why it affected people and it's the nanogenes that have caused them to be like that. They've read this dead boy who wanted his mummy and thought that that's what the human race are and so therefore was repairing everybody like that. It just, it, it's just so clever and it makes so much sense and I really, really like I just love a resolution when it feels really genuinely satisfying and successful, like it's earned and like it just makes perfect sense. So I'm really, really pleased with that part of this story. And it's also just a great triumphant episode and moment for the Doctor, I think, in this story where he, he gets to say everybody lives. And it's true that in this story, everybody is brought back who had seemingly died or become a gas mask person or whatever, that actually they've all for once, he's been able to say 
all of them, absolutely every single person. And I think that is such a great positive vibe for, for Doctor Who. I don't think this should happen in every single episode. Like, there are episodes where consequences need to be shown, things need to happen, where people do die, and that's a big part of the programme. But I think it's also OK to, to occasionally have this real triumphant success for the Doctor, where he does really does save everybody. Um, and just, just, it just kind of, you can see the pure joy and happiness on his face that he's actually been able to do this, to pull this off seemingly unexpectedly and saved everybody and even repaired people more than they're expecting. That, that entertaining moment where there's that old lady who's grown a leg back, which is just hilarious. Um, I love that moment. It's great fun. Um, and then even at the end when they save Captain Jack as well, when he's seemingly about to get blown up by the, the, um, bomb, German bomb that's going to, that was going to get dropped onto the, um, all the people in, in that sort of, um, a disused station, um, that actually they just turn up, turn up in the TARDIS to let him walk through and boom he saved happy days. So yes for what is just such a dark and scary Doctor Who episode or a Doctor Who story as a whole it's it's kind of almost to some extent surprising but also I think great that it has such a, a positive and happy resolution to this story as well that after all the dark creepy ideas thrown in I mean there's the amazing well I think the brilliant scene um, with the Doctor Rose and Jack when they go up to the child's room in, in the hospital and they're, they're chatting away about what's going on and, and all of this and you can initially hear the um, child on the tape recording and then kind of I realised it slightly before they did that actually the tape recording stopped and yet the kid is still talking and then suddenly they realise oh my days he's right there jump cut to him and it's just a great it's such a genuinely shocking moment like he really sort of makes you jump a little bit I think it's such a great, such a great I think it apparently won an award like best TV moment of the year or something in 2005 it's crazy that's certainly a very highly rated moment and it just works so so effectively um, in really just scaring you in that moment, I think, which is great. And like large amounts of series one, this still stands up really well to the test of time, it, particularly visually. I still think it works really, really effectively. The sort of scenes, but in both stories, both parts of the story of the transformation of, of humans into these gas mask zombie people with the gas mask kind of growing out of their mouth and growing on their eyes and things and over their head, I still think looks really, really good. And it's not perfect, but I don't think that it looks completely awful and unbelievable now. And sort of all the, the particularly the when we see the shots of the kind of um, the gas mask being sewed onto people's bodies or onto their faces, it, it does look very, very visually convincing. So I was really, really pleased and impressed with that and thought it just really showed how much a lot of Doctor Who, even from series one 15 years ago, can still stand up today. And so this story, of course, at the end of it, leaves Captain Jack as basically a companion with the Doctor and Rose um, for the final three episodes of the series, which is quite a, is, is something great. I think it's nice to kind of have somebody additional added to the TARDIS team. Obviously, he, he has always become a very, very, very popular character and it's been nice to explore the kind of early moments of Captain Jack just seeing who what he's like as a person in the early days um, and yet yeah, then seeing the end of this story him joining um, Rose and the Doctor and get, getting to explore him over the next three episodes as well. So overall I think it is fair to say that The Empty Child and The Doctor Dances is a definite highlight of series one it's instantly a classic script from Stephen Moffat where he just really hits all the right places in terms of a really well crafted tight knit story over two parts um, that really doesn't feature many plot holes or just many things that don't make any sense. Um, a really scary and spooky vibe throughout, a great setting for the story, great performances all around the introduction of a brilliant new character in Captain Jack, an overall highlight of series one. But guys, please do let me know what you think of um, The Empty Child and the Doctor's Answers, or particularly the second part down in the comments below. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on Captain Jack at this point. What did you think of him after he'd just been introduced into this first story? Were you pleased he was going to be carrying on as a companion, or were you not so sure? I'd love to hear particularly about that, what you guys have got to say down in the comments below. But apart from that, guys, as always, hit that like button, that subscribe button if you're new here, and I'll see you again very soon for a brand new one. Goodbye.